So today we're going to be doing May, June 2018, paper 23. Question number one says the elements sodium to chlorine in the third period all form oxides. Draw a diagram to show the shape of the molecule of each of the oxides SO3 and Cl2O. Name each shape. In SO3, each oxygen atom forms a double bond with the sulfur atom. Now, if you guys remember, sulfur has six outer electrons. Sulfur has six outer electrons. And it's making a double bond with each of the three oxygens. In other words, it's bonded to three oxygen atoms, right? And it's making a sigma bond and a pi bond with each of the oxygen atoms. So what we have is we have three, we have three double bonds around the sulfur atom, right? And because all six of the electrons of sulfur are bonded over here, there are no lone pairs, right? So we have three bonds and no lone pairs. So we know over here that if there's three sigma bonds and there's no lone pairs over here, right? This must be a trigonal planar geometry. You don't have to show the bond angle here because the question isn't explicitly asking for it. But we have a 120 degree bond angle here and the shape is called trigonal planar. Okay. Now what about Cl2O? What is the shape of Cl2O? Here oxygen is single bonded to two chlorine atoms. Okay, similar to what we have in H2O. So what do you think the shape over here is? Now again, if you guys remember, oxygen has six outer electrons. Two of those electrons, two of those electrons are bonded, right? With chlorines. So here we have oxygen bonded to two chlorine atoms, right? Two single bonds. And oxygen also has two lone pairs since it has a total of six electrons, right? So what we have over here is the total number of sigma bonds plus lone pairs over here is four, right? So we're going to need four hybrid orbitals. So here we have sp3 hybridization. Here we have sp3 hybridization, okay? And this shape over here, similar to water, okay, is called bent or you can say angular, okay? Or you can also say nonlinear. Each of these is acceptable, okay? Any one of these three, okay? These are all the same shape, bent, angular, or nonlinear. Explain why the melting point of magnesium oxide is higher than that of sodium oxide. So over here we can say, over here we can say that the strength, okay, or the electrostatic forces of attraction electrostatic forces of attraction okay or we can say the ionic bonds right are stronger are stronger between are stronger between between magnesium 2 plus and oxide ions okay then than those between sodium ions and oxide ions. And the reason why over here is that Mg2 plus has a greater charge. It has a greater charge and a smaller radius. Okay, it has a greater charge and a smaller radius than Na plus, right? So we can say it has a greater charge density. It has a greater charge density than Na plus. You can say greater charge density or you can also say that it has a greater charge per unit volume. The reason why is because the charge is greater and the radius is smaller. Okay, therefore it has a greater charge density, right? There's more charge per unit volume, right? You have a smaller cation and you have a greater charge. Okay, both of those things make the ionic bond stronger. Over here, the charge is actually playing a much bigger role than the radius, okay? The radius for the two Cations is very similar, but magnesium has twice the amount of charge. Therefore, it has a much greater charge density. Why is the melting point of silicon 4 oxide much higher than that of sulfur trioxide? Now, if you guys remember, silicon 4 oxide or silicon dioxide has a macromolecular structure, right? It's a giant covalent lattice. So in order to melt it, you have to break very strong covalent bonds, whereas sulfur trioxide is sim has a simple molecular structure. So you only have to overcome intermolecular forces, right? Van der Waals forces due to instantaneous induced dipole interactions, right? You have, you have a simple molecule here. So you just have Van der Waals forces. It's a nonpolar molecule. So you have very weak Van der Waals forces here. So we can say over here that SiO2 has a giant covalent structure, or we can say it has a macromolecular structure. Okay, You can say giant covalent, or you can say macromolecular structure. Okay, so we can say that, hence, 
very strong very strong covalent bonds very strong covalent bonds have to be broken okay in order to melt it in order to melt it okay this requires a lot more energy this requires a lot more energy to overcome okay than the than the van der waals forces van der waals forces okay due to i'll write that in parentheses due to instantaneous induced dipole interactions okay in so3 in so3 which has a simple molecular structure okay which is which has a simple molecular structure right this answer would also be sufficient for a three or four mark explanation all right in this particular case they probably wouldn't want it as detailed but but i'm just giving you the most detailed explanation here all right SO3 is produced by the reaction between SO2 and O2 in the contact process. A dynamic equilibrium is established. So we know that the contact process is used to manufacture sulfuric acid, right? And here's one of, here's the equilibrium that's part of this process. Explain why increasing the total pressure at constant temperature increases the rate of production of SO3 and increases the yield of SO3. So why does increasing the pressure increase the rate of the reaction? the forward and the backward reaction in both cases the rate increases why so what we have over here is we have gases okay we have gases in a container right we have gases in a container right and what, what i'm doing is what i'm doing over here is what i'm doing over here is when i increase the pressure when i increase the pressure i decrease the volume right because pressure is inversely proportional to volume pressure is inversely proportional to volume right so for gases we know that pressure will affect the volume of gases it won't affect anything else but over here we have gases right so when i increase the pressure right when i increase the pressure the volume decreases and when the volume decreases what happens is that that what we what we have over here is that the molecules okay that are reacting that are reacting are closer together right are closer together Another way to think about this is when I increase the pressure, when I increase the pressure, right, it means that the volume is decreasing, okay? And that means if you look at the concentration, which is the number of moles per unit volume, you have the number of moles is constant. We have the same amount of gases. But now if I decrease the volume, if I decrease the volume, that means the concentration is increasing. So molecules that are reacting are closer together, or we can say that the concentration is increasing over here, okay? And because of that we can say that because the molecules are closer together the frequency of successful collisions increases right there are more collisions happening because they're occupying a tighter space and because there are more collisions happening there's going to be there's going to be more reactions taking place and a reaction takes place when a successful collision takes place so there's more successful collisions that means there are more reactions taking place per unit time so frequency of successful collisions increases. So here again, because the, there are more particles per unit volume, or you have you have molecules that are reacting are much closer together, right? The concentration is increasing. So there are more particles per unit volume or more molecules per unit volume. The frequency, therefore, the frequency of successful collisions increases. Now, why does the yield increase when I increase the pressure? So on the left hand side, we have three moles of gas. On the right hand side, we have two moles of gas. Now, if you guys think about Le Chartier's principle, right? What does it say? It says that if I, if I make a change to a system, the system will respond by opposing that change or minimizing the effect of that change. Now over here, right? If I increase the pressure, if I increase the pressure, right? The system wants to decrease the pressure. Now we know that we know that the number of moles of gas or the pressure, the pressure is directly proportional to the number of moles of gas, right? 
Now I know that if I want to decrease the pressure, since I've increased it, since I've increased the pressure of the system, the system will try to decrease the pressure. If the system wants to decrease the pressure, if the system wants to decrease the pressure, it wants to decrease the number of moles of gas. And how will it decrease the number of moles of gas? Well, if it goes to the right hand side, right, it'll favor the side with fewer moles of gas. Because for every three moles of gas that react on the left, two moles of gas are produced. So for every reaction that takes place, we're reducing the number of moles of gas for the forward reaction. For every time, every time the forward reaction takes place, we're reducing the number of moles of gas. So the system is decreasing the pressure. So over here, that, that's why that's why an increase in pressure favors the side with fewer moles of gas. So we can say over here that there are fewer moles of gas, fewer moles of gas on the right. Okay, or on the product side. Therefore, therefore, the equilibrium shifts to the right. Okay. When pressure is increased. Okay. And this is done. This is again done to oppose to oppose the increase in pressure. Okay. So the equilibrium is shifting to the right. The equilibrium is shifting to the right to decrease the pressure because we increase the pressure of the system. The system responds by decreasing the pressure. Okay, that's how Le Chatelier's principle works. The graph shows how the concentration of all three species in the system change with time for a typical reaction mixture. The gradients of all three lines decrease with time and then level off in this dynamic equilibrium. Explain why the gradients of the SO2 and O2 lines decrease with time. So we have this equilibrium again. Okay, we have this equilibrium, right? And initially, initially what we have is initially we have zero moles of SO3, right? And we're starting with certain amounts of O2 and SO2, right? So the reaction. The, the gradient is the steepest at the beginning. The question is asking, why is the gradient decreasing? In other words, why is the graph getting less steep over time? Why is the graph getting less steep over time? So why are they consumed fastest at the beginning? Now we know that the concentration affects the rate. So initially we have the highest concentration of SO2 and O2. So initially they're gonna be consumed the fastest because the rate is higher at the beginning. The gradient of a concentration time graph, right? the gradient over here is, the change in concentration divided by the change in time, right? That is the rate. That's what the question is asking. Why is the rate decreasing with time? Higher concentration at the beginning means higher rate. As they're being consumed, right? Slowly they're making sulfur trioxide. Their concentration is decreasing and therefore the rate of the reaction is decreasing. So over here we can say that with time, with time, right? The concentration, the concentration of SO2 and O2 are decreasing, right? And we know that we know that as concentration decreases, right? And we know that as concentration decreases, right, the rate will decrease. The rate decreases. The rate over here is the gradient. So the rate decreases. Explain why all three lines become horizontal. So over time, what happens is that the lines become horizontal. So the concentration remains constant. So what does the line becoming horizontal represent? What has been reached at that point? Once the lines become horizontal, what's happened over here? So if the lines are becoming horizontal, that means the concentration is being becoming constant over time. In other words, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction. The rate at which SO2 and O2 are being consumed, they're being produced at the same rate. Okay, so SO3 is reacting at the same rate and it's also it's SO3 is decomposing and being produced at the same rate. The forward reaction and the backward reaction rates are equal. So we can say dynamic equilibrium has been established. So over here we can say that when the lines become horizontal, the rate of the forward reaction, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backward reaction. Right? In other words, 
dynamic equilibrium is been established dynamic equilibrium has been reached okay or has been established all right suggest a reason why the initial gradient of the so2 line is steeper than that of the oxygen line so here the question is asking why is so2 being consumed faster initially than o2 why is so2 being consumed faster than oxygen we can see over here that for every one mole of oxygen two moles of sulfur dioxide are being consumed so obviously sulfur dioxide will be consumed faster right more moles of sulfur dioxide will be consumed per unit time than oxygen because for every every one mole of oxygen two moles of sulfur dioxide are consumed so over here we can say that that for every for every one mole of oxygen one mole of oxygen two moles of so2 are being consumed okay or are reacting over here two moles of so2 and two moles of oxygen are sealed in a container with a suitable catalyst at constant temperature and pressure the resulting equilibrium mixture contains 1.98 moles of so3 the total volume of the equilibrium mixture is 40 decimeter cube write the expression for the equilibrium constant kc for the reaction between so2 and oxygen to produce so3 so the kc over here is the concentration of the products right so we have so3 as the product to the power of its stoichiometric coefficients that will be so3 squared the concentration of so3 squared divided by the concentration of so2 squared times the concentration of oxygen calculate the amount in moles of so2 and o2 in the equilibrium mixture right so what we have over here is we have the following equilibrium we have so2 we have 2 so2 plus o2 reacting to form 2 so3 okay and what we can do over here is we can use something known as an ice table what is an ice table an ice table is telling me the initial amount the initial amounts that we have of each species is telling us the change that we have in the amounts and it's telling us the equilibrium amounts it's telling us the equilibrium amounts okay that's what the ice over here stands for now initially initially they said that we had two moles of we had two moles of sulfur dioxide and two moles of oxygen and we have zero moles of sulfur trioxide initially right and at equilibrium they've told us that we have 1.98 moles of sulfur trioxide okay so then we know that 1.98 moles of sulfur trioxide were produced right we know 1.98 moles of sulfur trioxide was produced so the change was plus 1.9 and we went from 0 to 1.98 so then how many moles of sulfur dioxide were consumed based on the stoichiometric ratios we know that if 1.98 moles of sulfur trioxide were being produced the same amount of sulfur dioxide would have been consumed because they react in a 1 is to 1 ratio for every mole of sulfur dioxide that's used up one mole of sulfur trioxide is produced or for every two moles of this two moles of this are produced so we can say 1.98 moles of so3 are produced we can say that 1.98 moles of so2 are being consumed so the change is negative 1.98 for sulfur dioxide so at equilibrium we have 0. Point, at equilibrium we have 0 0.02 moles right and for oxygen we know that for every two moles of sulfur trioxide that are produced one mole of o2 is consumed so if 1.98 moles of so3 are produced half as many moles of oxygen are being consumed so that will be negative 0 0.99 so at equilibrium we have 1.01 right 2 minus 1.98 and then 2 minus 0 0.99 so these are our equilibrium amounts so the ice table is used the ice table is used to calculate the number of moles okay so then we can say that the equilibrium amount that we have of so2 in moles is 0 0.02 moles and the equilibrium amount of oxygen gas that we have is 1.01 moles use your answers to d part 1 and d part 2 to calculate the value of kc for this equilibrium mixture give the units of kc now what we have is we have the equilibrium constant over here right we have the expression so we determined that in the previous part right so this is our kc and they've also told us they've also told us over here that we have the total volume of this the total volume of the container is 40 decimeter cube 
the total volume of the container is 40 decimeter cube. So can I say over here that I have the equilibrium number of moles for each the reactants and the products. So can I say that the concentrations, the concentration is simply the number of moles divided by the volume, right? The volume is 40 decimeter cube over here. So I can say over here that if we look at our KC, what we have is the number of moles of sulfur trioxide equilibrium was 1.98 divided by 40, right? That's my concentration of sulfur trioxide, number of moles divided by volume, okay? Let me square that, divided by, divided by, we have the concentration of sulfur dioxide. For sulfur dioxide, we had 0 0.02 moles at equilibrium. So that's 0 0.02, number of moles divided by the volume. So that's 40, right, squared. And for oxygen, we have 1.01 moles, right? So the concentration is 1.01 .01 divided by 40, right? The volume is already given in decimeter cube. So then what does the value of Kc come out to over here? So here the value comes out to 3.88 into 10 to the power of 5, right? Now, what are the units for Kc? What are the units for Kc? The units that we have is in the numerator, we have concentration squared. Okay, we have concentration squared in the numerator and we have concentration cube in the denominator, right? We have concentration squared times concentration. So the units that we have is 1 over concentration, which is 1 divided by moles per decimeter cube, right? So then if we take this in numerator, that becomes moles to the power of negative one, right? That's mole to the power of negative one, dm to the power of three. Okay, so those are our units for the equilibrium constant, okay? So over here, we can say that our equilibrium constant is 3.88 times 10 to the power of five mole inverse dm cube, okay? So the value of Kc is 3.88 times 10 to the power of five, and the units are mole inverse dm cube. So here we have question number two. It says one reason for the wide variety of organic compounds is isomerism, either structural isomerism or stereoisomerism. Explain the meaning of the term structural isomerism. So all isomers, okay, by definition, isomers are different molecules that have the same molecular formula. Okay, now structural isomers have the same molecular formula, but different structural formulae. Okay, so they're molecules that have the same molecular formula. So we can say molecules with the same molecular formula, with the same molecular formula, but different, but different structural formulae. Okay, or you can say with different structures. Okay, but different structures, or you can say different structural formulae. Okay, explain the meaning of the term stereoisomerism. Now for stereoisomerism, obviously there are isomers, so the molecular formula is the same, but what else is the same for stereoisomers? Stereoisomers also have the same structural formula, okay? So stereoisomers are molecules, okay? With the same, with the same structural formulae, okay? Obviously the molecular formula are the same, that's, that's true for all isomers, okay? But the structural formula are also the same for stereoisomers. So they are the same structural formulae, but different, but different spatial arrangement of atoms. Different spatial arrangement, arrangements of atoms. So what that means over here is that the word stereo over here, the word stereo over here is referencing to 3D space, okay? So they have the same structural formula, but they also, but, but the, the 3D shape or the 3D structure is slightly different. That's why we say that they have different spatial arrangements of atoms. They only, they only differ in the 3D structures, okay? Pentuanine does not show stereoisomerism. Give two reasons why pentuanine does not show stereoisomerism. So when we talk about stereoisomerism, there's two types we've looked at. We looked at geometric isomerism and optical isomerism. Specifically within geometric isomerism, we've looked at cis-trans isomerism. So the question is essentially saying, why doesn't it show cis-trans isomerism and why doesn't it show optical isomerism, right? Now over here, it doesn't show, it does not show cis-trans isomerism because one of the carbon atoms, right? One of the carbon atoms in the 
carbon carbon double bond right is bonded to is bonded to two identical two identical hydrogen atoms so it doesn't show cis trans isomerism or geometric isomerism over here right so that's the reason why it doesn't show geometric isomerism and the reason it doesn't show optical isomerism is because there's no chiral center so over here we can also say that right there's no chiral center present or no chiral carbon atoms are present are present in this molecule a structural isomer of pent 1ene is used as the monomer to form a polymer the repeat unit of this polymer is shown draw the displayed formula of the monomer used to make this polymer give the name of the monomer now this polymer right they've shown the repeat unit and we know that initially initially we must have had a carbon carbon double bond between these two carbons along the main polymer chain right so that pi bond when it broke when that pi bond broke it made these sigma bonds right that's how you made the polymer so now what happens what we have over here is that this carbon atom right this carbon atom is bonded to two hydrogens right and the other carbon atom that we have is bonded to a ch3 and it was bonded to a ch2 ch3 so this was the monomer that was used to make this polymer this monomer when the pi bond broke it polymerized to give us this repeat unit in the polymer and what's the displayed formula for this the displayed formula over here is we have a carbon carbon double bond which has a hydrogen atom here hydrogen atom here then we have a carbon with three hydrogens right that's a methyl group and then we also have an ethyl group that is a ch2 ch2 and then a ch3 okay so you have to show all the bonds in the displayed formula and what's the name of this monomer we have a four carbon chain right we have a four carbon chain right the alkene gets the numbering priority so we have an alkene on carbon number one and a methyl group on carbon number two so over here we have two methyl but one ene right we have two methyl but one ene we have a four carbon chain with the alkene on carbon number one so that's but one ene and a methyl on carbon number two so two methyl but one ene a different structural isomer of pent one ene shows geometrical isomerism draw the structure of one of the two geometrical isomers with the formula c5h10 give the full name of this isomer so now what we have is we have a five carbon alkene that shows cis trans isomerism right so we know that the double bond the double bond can't be on the terminal carbon right because then you'd have a ch2 so it must be on the middle carbon over here it must be on the middle carbon over here right and now what we have is okay we have to we have to show it clearly as one of the two geometrical isomers so we have to clearly show the cis trans isomerism over here so what we have over here is that this carbon this carbon atom here is bonded to a methyl right so let me draw it like this right so it's bonded to a methyl like this a ch3 and it's bonded to a hydrogen and then this carbon atom here is bonded to an ethyl group and a hydrogen atom that i haven't shown here so we're going to show it like this okay we should show it in the trigonal planar shape because we have to clearly show that it's a cis trans isomer over here right and the isomer that I've drawn here, is this the cis isomer or the trans isomer? The two hydrogen atoms are on the same side. So the way I've shown it over here is the cis isomer, right? It's the cis isomer. And what's the name of this compound? You have a five carbon chain. You have a five carbon chain, right? And the carbon-carbon the double bond is on carbon number two. So what we have over here is we have cis pent two in. You could have also shown the two hydrogens being opposite each other, in which case it would have been trans pent 2 ene. So here we have question number three. The elements in group 17, the halogens, show trends in both their chemical and physical properties. The elements and their compounds have a wide variety of uses. At room temperature, fluorine and chlorine are gases. Bromine is a liquid and iodine is a solid. State the trend in volatility of the group 17 elements down the group so we know that the boiling point increases down the group right 
So that means the volatility is decreasing down the group, right? Volatility refers to the tendency to form vapor, right? And we know that fluorine and chlorine are gases, whereas bromine is a liquid and iodine is a solid. So as you go down the group, there's a great, there's a lesser tendency or a decreasing tendency to be in the gaseous form, right? Explain this trend. Why does the volatility decrease down the group or why does the boiling point increase down the group? We know over here that all the halogen molecules are obviously nonpolar molecules, right? So as you go down the group, as you go down the group, the number of electrons increases, right? Down the group, the number of electrons increases. Down the group, the number of electrons increases, right? Therefore, van der Waals forces or intermolecular forces, right? Due to instantaneous dipole induced dipole interactions, get stronger down the group, right? So over here we can say that the therefore the strength of the strength of the van der Waals forces due to instantaneous dipole induced dipole interactions increases. Okay, hence boiling point increases or we can say volatility decreases okay iodine can be displaced from sodium iodide by chlorine write an equation for this reaction so here cl2 is reacting with sodium iodide to form to form nacl and iodine okay and this is a redox reaction okay there's a redox reaction chlorine is the strongest oxidizing agent okay when we're when we're looking at chlorine bromine and iodine when we're looking at chlorine bromine and iodine right chlorine is the strongest oxidizing agent whereas iodide is the strongest reducing agent okay from the halides so iodide over here is the strongest reducing agent so chlorine is easily able to oxidize iodide or iodide is easily able to reduce chlorine Okay, so chlorine is reduced from 0 to minus 1 and iodide is oxidized from minus 1 to 0. All right, silver nitrate solution is added to separate solutions of sodium iodide and sodium chloride. Precipitates form. An excess of aqueous ammonia is then added to both precipitates. Complete the table to give the color and name of the precipitate formed in each reaction and the effect of the addition of an excess of aqueous ammonia to each of the precipitates. All right, so when silver and iodide form a precipitate, what's the color of the precipitate? Sodium iodide, when it reacts with silver nitrate, okay, we get a precipitate called silver iodide. We get a precipitate called silver iodide. And what's the color of this precipitate? This is a yellow precipitate. Okay, this is a yellow precipitate. Now, what about silver and chloride? They form silver chloride together. What's the color of this precipitate? This is a white precipitate. And which of these precipitates dissolves in aqueous ammonia? One of them dissolves, one of them doesn't dissolve. When you add aqueous ammonia to these precipitates, silver chloride dissolves. Okay. So the observation that we have over here is the effect of adding aqueous ammonia is that silver chloride will dissolve, whereas for whereas for silver iodide, you will see no change. Okay. Silver Silver iodide is insoluble in aqueous ammonia in dilute as well as as well as concentrated ammonia. Okay. Write an ionic equation including state symbols to show the reaction occurring when silver nitrate is added to sodium iodide. Right now, the sodium and nitrate over here are just spectator ions. Okay, so what you have over here is you have silver ions, okay, that are aqueous, reacting with iodide ions, right, which are also aqueous. To form silver iodide which is a solid solid sodium iodide reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid to form purple fumes of gaseous iodine right iodine vapor and hydrogen sulfide gas however when solid sodium chloride reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid the only gas produced is HCl explain the difference in the reactions of concentrated sulfuric acid with sodium iodide and with NaCl your answer should refer to the role of the sulfuric acid in each reaction. So what we see over here is that with sodium chloride, right? With sodium chloride, 
we see that the chloride ions remain chloride ions, right? The oxidation number remains negative one. Whereas with sodium iodide, what we see is that sulfuric acid is oxidizing iodide from negative one to form iodine, right? That's zero. And so sulfuric acid itself is undergoing reduction. The oxidation number of sulfur and sulfuric acid is plus six, whereas in hydrogen sulfide, it's negative two. So iodide ions are actually reducing sulfuric acid over here, right? In other words, sulfuric acid is acting as an oxidizing agent. It's oxidizing the iodide ions here. So we can say that with sodium chloride, with sodium chloride, okay, sulfuric acid acts as an acid, okay, it only acts as an acid. There's no redox reactions taking place here. The equation for this reaction is the following, right? What you have is you have NaCl reacting with H2SO4 to form NaHSO4 plus HCl. Right? So all you have is the H from sulfuric acid is going to the chloride ions, right? Sulfuric acid is acting as a proton donor and chloride is simply accepting a proton over here. Alternatively, you can also show Na2SO4 being formed in HCl. Okay, either one of these is acceptable. On the other hand, when we look at when we look at sodium iodide, when we look at sodium iodide over here, right? What we can say is that H2SO4 H2SO4 acts as an acid and an oxidizing agent. Okay, so over here it is an oxidizing agent. Okay, and an acid. The reason why over here is that iodide is a stronger reducing agent, is a stronger reducing agent than Cl minus. Okay, then Cl minus. So what that means over here is the what that means over here is that iodide is able to reduce sulfuric acid, and if sulfuric acid is undergoing reduction, it means that it's acting as an oxidizing agent, right? Sulfuric acid is undergoing reduction to form hydrogen sulfide. So if by definition, if something undergoes reduction, it's an oxidizing agent. So because iodide ions are stronger reducing agents, they're able to reduce sulfuric acid, or we can say that sulfuric acid is able to oxidize iodide because iodide is a stronger reducing agent it can more easily be oxidized okay whereas chloride doesn't undergo oxidation that easily so it's a weaker reducing agent chlorine is commonly used in water purification when chlorine is added to water it reacts to produce a mixture of acids one of which is chloric one acid hclo a powerful oxidizing agent explain the meaning of the term oxidizing agent in terms of electron transfer now we've already seen that oxidizing agents are species that undergo reduction. So if something is undergoing reduction, what does that mean in terms of electron transfer? Is it gaining electrons or is it losing electrons? It means that it's gaining electrons over here. So we know that oxidizing agents, they undergo reduction. So they are species that gain electrons, okay? Alternatively, you can say that they are, they are electron acceptors. Suggest an equation for this reaction of chlorine with water, okay? When chlorine reacts with water, it produces HClO, right? That's given to us as well as HCl. So this is actually a redox reaction and this is a disproportionation reaction, right? It's a special type of redox reaction known as disproportionation because what we see is that some of the chlorine atoms, right? Some of the chlorine atoms are oxidized from zero to plus one in chloric one acid and some of the chlorine atoms are being reduced from zero to minus one so the same element atoms from the same atoms from the same reactant some of them are being oxidized and some of them are being reduced hence the term disproportionation okay this is a disproportionation reaction write an equation for the reaction of chlorine with hot aqueous sodium hydroxide use oxidation numbers to explain why this is a redox reaction with hot aqueous sodium hydroxide, you also have a disproportionation reaction, okay? What happens is that Cl2 reacts with NaOH aqueous, okay, to form NaCl and NaCl O3, okay? That is sodium chlorate 5. This is called sodium chlorate 5 over here, okay? And we also form, we also form H2O. You have to balance this equation, right? So what we have is we have three Cl2, you have six NaOH over here, you have five NaCl, 
one NaClO3 and three H2O, right? So what happens over here is what happens over here is that chlorine, right? It start in the elemental form. The oxidation number is zero, right? In sodium chloride, it's minus one. Whereas in sodium chloride, it's five. It's plus five. Okay, you can you can calculate this for yourselves. This is sodium chlorate five, right? So what's again what we have is a disproportionation reaction for every for every five chlorine atoms that are reduced by minus one one chlorine atom is being oxidized by plus five that's where you get the five is to one ratio so what we have over here is that what we have over here is that chlorine some of the chlorine atoms okay some of the chlorine atoms are being oxidized so chlorine is oxidized from zero to plus five and some of the chlorine atoms are also being reduced so we can also say that chlorine is being reduced right from zero to minus one so here we have question number four that says a is ch3 chbr ch2 ch3 that is two bromo butane okay so the first part of the question is saying name a and we just did that right that is two bromo butane right we have a four carbon chain a straight chain over here and we have a bromine atom on carbon number two name the class of compound to which d belongs right d is formed when the secondary alcohol when the secondary alcohol reacts with acidified dichromate okay this will be in the presence of heat so when it reacts with acidified dichromate the secondary alcohol forms compound b so what is the secondary alcohol oxidized to right remember acidified dichromate is an oxidizing agent and we know that the secondary alcohol will be oxidized to a ketone okay, so the class of compounds will be ketones there are three structural isomers of a draw the structures of these three isomers of a so a was this guy over here ch3 ch br ch2 ch3 okay now the th this three structural isomers we could have in other straight chain compound we could have another straight chain compound like this okay but what we could have is we could have the bromine atom on the first carbon that would be one bromobutane so that's one possibility right we have a straight chain again just like here we have a straight chain but instead of carbon number two the bromine is on carbon number one this is one bromobutane we can also have we can also have branched isomers we can also have branched isomers over here right so if you add branching over here right this is what we can have now the bromine atom right could be on carbon number one any one of these three right doesn't matter they're all identical it could be on carbon number one or it could be on carbon number two so what we have over here is either the bromine atom is on carbon number one right so something like this we have a ch2 br over here and then we have a ch3 here we have a ch3 here and then we have h over here or we could have the bromine on carbon number two so then we have something like this ch3 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 so these are the four structural isomers you have two bromobutane you have one bromobutane okay you can have one bromo two methyl propane or you can have two bromo two methyl propane reaction one occurs by two different mechanisms at the same time these mechanisms are referred to as the SN1 and SN2 mechanisms. State what the letters S and N represent in the abbreviation SN1. So what, do, what does the S stand for and what does the N stand for? So let's see over here. What does the S stand for in this? Now what's happening in reaction 1 over here is in reaction 1, we're converting a halogenoalkane 2-bromobutane into an alcohol, right? We're making butane 2-all. Making butane 2-all over here. So what we have is a nucleophilic substitution reaction. And we have two types of nucleophilic substitution mechanisms. You can either have the SN1 mechanism or the SN2 mechanism. So S over here stands for, so the S over here stands for substitution. Okay, and the N stands for nucleophilic. Complete the SN1 mechanism for this reaction, for reaction one. Include the structure of the intermediate and all necessary charges, dipoles, lone pairs, and curly arrows. Okay. What we have over here is, if you guys remember, 
tertiary halogeno alkanes tertiary halogeno alkanes favor the sn1 mechanism which is a two step mechanism right we form an intermediate primary halogen of alkanes favor the sn2 mechanism which is a one step mechanism here we have a secondary halogen alkane the carbon with the halogen atom is bonded to two carbon atoms and one hydrogen so this is a secondary halogen alkane it undergoes both the sn1 and the sn2 mechanism simultaneously okay some of the molecules will react by sn1 some will react by sn2 they want us to draw the sn1 mechanism for this which is the two step mechanism right in the first step what happens is we have heterolysis take place right you have a delta negative bromine and a delta positive carbon you end up making a carbocation intermediate okay so we have a ch3 bonded to this carbon with a ch2 ch3 right and an h and what you have over here is now what you have over here is right so here you have your carbocation intermediate and then a second step what you have is the hydroxide ions which are your nucleophiles right they form a dative bond with the with the positively charged carbon so they donate that lone pair of electrons over here and this results in the formation of the final product which is butane 2 all over here the sn1 mechanism for reaction 1 is repeated using 2 chlorobutane instead of 2 bromobutane or 2 iodobutane instead of 2 bromobutane state and explain how the rates of these two reactions will compare with the rate of the original reaction using 2 bromobutane so first when we compare 2 chlorobutane with 2 bromobutane we know that with 2 chlorobutane right the reaction will be slower the reaction will be slower will be slower with with the 2 chlorobutane than with 2 bromobutane okay okay because because the ccl bond okay ccl bond is stronger is stronger than the cbr bond or we can say it has a higher bond energy than the cbr bond okay we can also say that the reaction will be faster the reaction will be faster with two iodobutane because the ci bond is weaker than the cbr bond because the ci bond is weaker than the cbr bond okay or has a lower bond energy because remember what happens is that in the first step of this reaction right the bond has to break right that requires activation energy the stronger the bond the more energy needed for to break that bond the higher the activation energy the slower the reaction because the ccl bond is stronger because the chlorine atoms have a smaller radius so you have a stronger covalent bond than with the bromine atom so this takes more time because it has a higher activation energy and because iodide or iodine atoms are much larger than bromine atoms this bond is much weaker okay and therefore requires a lower activation energy so you have a faster reaction reaction 2 uses the same reagent as reaction 1 but under different conditions state two differences in the conditions needed to ensure that reaction 2 is more likely to take place than reaction 1 when that reagent is added so over here reaction 2 reaction 2 over here okay is when you eliminate a halogen when you eliminate hbr to form an alkene okay reaction 2 is elimination of hbr to form an alkene is reaction 1 is hydrolysis right nucleophilic substitution to form alcohols now if water is present under aqueous conditions hydrolysis takes place nucleophilic substitution takes place okay whereas if water is absent so instead of water we're going to use ethanol as a solvent over here we're going to use ethanol as a solvent okay so if you use eth NaOH and ethanol then halogenoalkanes undergo elimination okay so over here we're going we're going to use the same reagents but in, instead of instead of aqueous we're going to use NaOH in ethanol okay NaOH in ethanol all right and so that's one difference in conditions the solvent is ethanol as opposed to aqueous okay or water and for elimination we need a higher temperature than you need for substitution okay elimination requires a very high temperature 
Same with, uh, same with elimination of alcohols. When you use concentrate sulfuric acid or we use aluminum oxide, it requires a much higher temperature. Okay, so a higher temperature, a higher temperature is needed. Okay, when heating under reflux, when heating under reflux, or you can say just you can just say when heating. Okay.